This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. These were farmers, men that worked in stores, blacksmiths, who faced a set of circumstances that plucked them from their everyday life, dropped them into the most horrid of conditions, and yet they came out on the other side with our world a better place. Many soldiers fought bravely and selflessly during World War I, many making the ultimate sacrifice in order to make the world a better place. Unfortunately, their courageous actions are largely being forgotten and overlooked. But thankfully, there is a campaign working hard to make sure these brave soldiers are not forgotten. The United States World War I Commission was formed uh, approximately two and a half years ago at the uh, request of the President of the United States and its purposes to uh, make the the public uh, and the nation aware of the fact that much w was sacrificed during World War I and to commemorate the 100th anniversary of this history period and to give the uh, nation a uh, chance to commemorate uh, this period in a proper manner. I'm chair of the Tennessee Great War Commission, which was created by the state legislature in order to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Great War, or the World War I. And we were created, uh, we met for the first time last January, and we were charged with commemorating the war with having at least one centennial event every year. Tennessee State Parks is going to be involved with the commemoration of the Great War by working in partnership with the Great War Commission, those people that are working across the state to tell the stories of Tennesseans and World War I. It's quickly becoming the Forgotten War and it's quickly becoming the, um, the war that people just don't think about. They don't think about the connections and how the world changed during that time period. All sorts of ways that World War I affects us and that most people are woefully unaware of. And of course, without World War I, there's no World War II, there's no Cold War, and there's no mess in the Middle East. So World War I continues to affect us to this day. The purpose of the Tennessee Great War Commission um, is to impart upon the next generation um, the, the knowledge and the, the understanding of World War I. It is to provide educational opportunities as we enter the centennial period of World War I. With Tennessee State Parks, we're focusing much of our efforts on the Sergeant Alvin C. York State Historic Park in Pall Mall, Tennessee. A project that we're working on that we're particularly proud of is the recreation of a World War I era trench system, much like the uh, soldiers, the doughboys, and others fought in uh, during the Great War. Trench warfare develops out of necessity due to the technology that's being utilized during the war. So the being, bringing about of machine guns, heavy artillery, things like that, made men had to go deeper into the earth to protect themselves. So really beginning in 1914, in Europe, before the United States was even involved in the war, trenches began being constructed across the continent. They stretched at times for miles upon miles. Some of them were hastily constructed, some of them were more intricately constructed, like the one we've built here at York. What we're trying to do is add a living history component to better tell the, uh, the York story uh, here at the park. Um, this trench is constructed on the uh, original farm that Alvin York was given uh, through the Rotary Club uh, when he returned home from the, the Great War in 1919. He was raised in a dirt floor cabin. Um, he was, they were very poor. They basically ate what they raised or ate what they um, hunted. Um, his father was killed in, when he was 16 years old, and then he had to assume the, the head of the household duties. He didn't have a concept of the ocean, the Europe, um, the, the war, different cultures. His world was his backyard. He was not a young man when he was drafted to go to World War I. Uh, he was almost 30 years old, uh, which seems pretty odd by today's standards uh, to have a man that's close to 30 years old being shipped off with new recruits uh, to go and fight a battle. He did not want to go. He didn't understand what was what was happening. Um, he 
the, his world was so small, he had barely left Fentress County um, when the war broke out. So um, his world was very small though, and he didn't understand the conflict, he didn't understand the military, and um, he did not want to fight. He was a conscientious objector. So he filled out his draft card, yes, don't want to fight. And you pluck him out of this valley, where it's a very isolated area, you know, you don't have a plethora of cars or technology. People are still, you know, plowing with uh, mules and uh, double shovels and that sort of thing. And then you, you take that young man, or uh, not quite young man, but you take him and drop him off over in, in France, and he sees a whole different world, which opened his eyes. He was a compliment soldier. Even though he was, he followed the rules, he didn't mind taking direction, he didn't mind working hard. Um, and shoot, three hot meals a day without having to go out and pick your, pick your meal or shoot your meal. Um, three hot meals served you a day, fresh clothes, clean clothes, new boots. In a way, he was kind of in hog heaven, you know. He was working as hard as he worked at home, but here he had all these luxuries. I would contest that that extra age and maturity probably helped him uh, when he was uh, involved in some, some action there, uh, the, uh, the action that ultimately earned him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, he was part of a group that helped to capture uh, 132 total prisoners, uh, 128 being soldiers and four officers. So because of that and because of uh, the story being told, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. What sort of special circumstances uh, were created that plucked these men out of the backwoods of Tennessee and placed them in the uh, centerpiece of world history going on in Europe. How were their lives affected? How did the ever-changing technology of warfare affect these men, not only from Tennessee, but all across the world? <laughs> Several Tennesseans took it upon themselves. They saw they either they thought that this was going to be a glorious, fun time, or they said that yeah, I need to go over there and help. So we had medical doctors who went over. We had adventurers like Paul and Kiffin Rockwell. You know, they joined the French Foreign Legion. And, and Kiffin writes in a letter home. He thought that being in the Foreign Legion would be exciting. You know, he thought it'd be dashing. He said it's like being a janitor and being shot at. So. Um, that glamour quickly went away. Now, now he does get the glamour back when he becomes a pilot. And that's the only part of the war that's ever been romanticized. Because it was the first war where industrialization really uh, took part in. We had uh, massive bombardments of artillery, killing fields from machine guns that had not been used in war warfare before, uh, the advent of poisonous gas uh, into the battlefield. All of these things led to just a meat grinder uh, that our boys from Tennessee and all across the United States were, were forced to be a part of. Tennesseans weren't the only ones who went to, went to fight or went to serve in, in some non-combative capacity, but Tennessee lives up to its volunteer spirit. You know, we got the nickname the Volunteer State in eight, during the War of 1812 because quotas were, our quotas were 3,500 men. 10 times that number said, I want to go fight. And that's happened consistently throughout Tennessee's history. A lot of other Tennesseans made significant contributions to the war and the war effort. Right here in Cookville, the Smith family, Rutledge Smith, his wife, Graham McGregor, they played an important role. Rutledge Smith, who had been the, the vice president of the Tennessee Central Railway, was good friends with the Secretary of War, Newton Baker. And Newton Baker asked him to oversee the draft for the entire southeast region. Smith was in charge of the draft for the 11 former states of the Confederacy. And according to William J. Breen, he ran the cleanest draft in America. Gray McGregor Smith did an incredible thing. Uh, she decided to keep tabs on every Tennessean who either enlisted or was drafted. Uh, and over 60,000 men that she's keeping up with. And we're, we're, great, we're very grateful to her because when the the National Archives in St. Louis burned in 1975, those records were lost. But we have them because of this woman. Ed Buford, Captain Ed Buford, was Tennessee's only flying ace. He flew a number of missions, but he, more, more importantly, he flew with Eddie Rickenbacker and Frank Luke and other prestigious pilots in the uh, Hat in the Ring Squadron. And those guys flew in contraptions that it's amazing. You know, 
the, the one of the planes that was flown was called it was the de Havilland, which they called the flying coffin. Uh, and and before George Garros came up with a way of synchronizing the machine gun with propeller, people shot their propellers off. Uh, you know, it was crazy, and you know. People took up pets with them. They did all kinds of crazy things. It took a special breed of person to be a pilot, and Buford was certainly that sort of man. The 30th Division, uh, they trained at Camp Severe, named after John Sevier, who was a hero to the Carolinians and to the Tennesseans. And after training at Camp Sevier, they go to England where they trade in their American gear for British gear. And then they're posed to be involved in one of the most important battles in the war. On September the 29th, uh, they're gonna make a frontal assault on the Hindenburg Line. This has been done numerous times to no avail. Australians on one flank of the Americans, Brits on the other flank, and at five o'clock in the morning, they're awakened and told to write their wills. And at seven o'clock, an artillery barrage was supposed to start that was gonna take out the wire. There were five belts of wire that the soldiers had to get through. Then once they get through the wire, there's a steep embankment that takes them to the San Catan Canal. And they're supposed to get across the San Catan Canal, up the other slope, and take out hardened positions and then move forward to the town of Bellacore. The artillery barrage does not cut the wire su sufficiently. Tanks that were supposed to be there didn't show up. And so the Americans, the, the 30th Division, had gotten out ahead of the lines. They had gotten off the tape and they're way out in front of everybody and they're being cut to ribbons. They're taking friendly fire as, as well as enemy fire. So Joseph B. Adkinson of Egypt, Tennessee, decides to, he's going to throw caution to the wind. He somehow gets through the five belts of wire. He gets down the bank. He gets across the canal. The canal is roughly 40 yards across and about 40 feet deep. It's September 29th. It's been raining daily since the end of August. It's cold. It's foggy. It's wet. He gets across the canal. He scrambles up the bank. And according to his Medal of Honor citation, he kicked the machine gun into the nest and then dispatches these guys with grenades. He went on to take out two more machine gun nests. Well, Adkinson's actions inspired Milo Lemert. Milo was from Cumberland County. He gets, he gets across the canal too. He gets through the wire, gets across the canal, gets up the bank, takes out a machine gun nest with grenades, goes to a second machine gun nest. And these things are 150 to 200 yards apart. So he runs to another machine gun nest, takes it out, goes to a third machine gun nest, takes it out. By this time, he's out of his own weapons, his, his own ammunition, and so he's, he's scound, scrounging from the German machine gun nest. He's on his way to his fourth machine gun nest when he's cut to ribbons. And on that day, September 29th, this, it's this impossible task. Uh, the, the, you know, the British had been doing this time after time after time to no avail. Edward Talley from Hawkins County, he, tries to get, he, he also takes out a few machine gun nests. And then on October the 8th, as the advance makes it, heading towards the German frontier, we have two guys with their company who are just, they're, they're pinned down. Supplies have not been able to come up from the rear. They, the Lewis guns that they have are all jammed and, and they need new barrels, they need everything else. They're running low on ammunition and they're being cut down by a machine gun nest. And so Calvin Ward, the only Medal of Honor winner to be dishonorably discharged. And Buck Carnes say, we've got to protect our guys. We've got to, we've got to get out of this mess. And so against all odds, they make a frontal assault on a hardened pillbox machine gun emplacement, and they're able to successfully do it. But we had lots of people, you know, several women who went over, so I'm, I'm a nurse. I want to go over and see what I can do to help. Or we had, we had a clergyman who went over. You know, there was a doctor from Knoxville who was, joined the Black Watch and was, was you know, dealing with Scotsmen being you know, wounded, and he's captured by the Germans. 
and ends up being a doctor for German, you know, soldiers who are, are hurt. And he said that, you know, with the with that Hippocratic oath, you just try to help anybody you can. You don't choose sides. So, there, there, we had Tennesseans who were high mind, with high minded idealism, and then folks who are going for a sense of adventure. So it's a, it's a large spectrum. World War One affects us in ways today that people don't realize. You know, we people started going clean shaven in World War One. If you looked at that pictures of folks at the turn of the century, everybody's got big beards, like a lot of people today. But you can't get a tight seal on a gas mask if you've got a beard. So people went clean shaven as a matter of course. Women started cutting their hair. And people also did, the, you know, folks started wearing gunk in their hair. Not because it was, it was fashionable, though it became fashionable, but to do things like kill lice, because lice were ubiquitous in the trenches. And people wore, you know, started wearing wristwatches because a pocket watch could get you killed. You know, most of the fighting takes place at night. You pull out your pocket watch, very light goes off, it illuminates the pocket watch. You've got metal insignia on your neck and you just triangulate and shoot right there. And so the British lost about nearly a quarter of their officer corps in the, in the first six months of fighting. So today, soldiers in the field have cloth insignia. That goes back to World War I. And so there are all kinds of things that, that affect us to this day. You know, because people didn't go clean shaven, there were two guys, the Camp brothers, they invented the safety razor back in 1867. Nobody wanted it. Well, they sold their patent for a dollar in 1914 to King Gillette. And we certainly know his name, don't we? And William Cooper Proctor got the concession to provide soap to our soldiers. We know Proctor and Gamble today. In 1916, we had a guy named Clarence Saunders in Memphis who comes up with the idea for the do-it-yourself grocery store. And so Piggly Wiggly becomes the first franchise do-it-yourself grocery store in the United States. And of course, in 1917, the Moon Pie was created in Chattanooga. And what's Tennessee without RC, Moon Pie, things of that nature? The Tennessee Equal Suffrage League was gaining great momentum uh, in 1914 at the time World War I broke out. The organization had been founded uh, right after the turn of the century. It had always remained small and it had women in the four major cities of the state. Most of the mainline suffragists supported the President Wilson and the entry into war and made a decision that they would cease their suffrage work until the war ended. One smaller, more radical group of suffragists said, no, this is the time to strike while there is a crisis going on. So led by Alice Paul, who had been a member of the Mainline Suffrage Association, she broke away from that group and was followed out the door by a Tennessee woman, Sue Shelton White, their group became the National Women's Party, and they kept the pressure on President Wilson throughout uh, the, the war. Museums and galleries throughout Tennessee do their part to remind the public of the bravery shown during the Great War, bravery that helped give all of us the many freedoms we enjoy every day. Some of the, the really leading artists of the day were involved in creating posters for the Great War. And oftentimes they'd only make one. And it was sort of like their wartime contribution. Uh, it was total war, everyone was expected to do something and so this was a way that an artist might contribute if he wasn't actually serving. So Charles Dana Gibson actually headed up the Department of Pictorial Publicity, which was within the Committee on Public Information. And he was the one who, he created posters, but he also recruited all of these artists. Columbia is actually on the top of the U.S. Capitol building, and she was a figure that was a female personification of America. Um, think Christopher Columbus, so all of this is coming from the same place. And she's always dressed as a Grecian goddess, often has a tiara. Um, and in one poster in particular, she 
She's carrying a sword and it's down at her side, so she's ready for battle, but the flag is what she's really carrying and you have this billowing American flag behind her. And so the flag is another patriotic symbol that we saw an awful lot in posters, as well as Uncle Sam. One of the key people uh, who would eventually become the state librarian archivist was John Trotwood Moore. And it was through his work and Captain George Beerworth that we today have a museum. Between George Beerworth and John Trotwood Moore, they managed to get cannons shipped over from France and uh, guns and uniform, all kinds of material from the war souvenirs. And this actually built up the collections, and we have a lot of that material in our collections today from their efforts. Beerworth was a Canadian uh, c citizen originally, but he came to Nashville in the turn of around 1910, right before the First World War. And uh, when, war came, when war started in 1914, he went overseas and served with the Canadian Expeditionary Force. And he was a, appointed a, a captain. And so he was uh, wounded. And during that time, he was in hospital in England. And he created a model, a diorama, we would call it today, of the Western Front. And uh, when he came back, to uh, the United States after the war, he uh, built a, a diorama, a very lifelike diorama. In fact, some of the, the veterans said that it brought them to tears looking at the diorama because it was so uh, much an exact replica of the Hindenburg Line. Joseph Christian Leyendecker was another very famous illustrator of the day. And we have a picture by him and it's a beautiful gilded image of a Boy Scout, and he's kneeling and he's holding up a sword to Lady Liberty as they both look off into the distance, and it says, buy bonds. Um, the Boy and Girl Scouts of America actually sold bonds door to door. Over 20 million Americans bought a bond during the First World War, and this is a really neat image of that. And Lion Decker actually was an immigrant to America, so American society at this time had just gone through a huge wave of immigration from Europe, particularly from Eastern Europe, and Lion Decker was German. Um, so he's a German, but he was American by the time of the First World War and certainly identified with that cause and created propaganda for the government. The Tennessee Great War Commission is reaching out to communities through various programs and reenactments to bring awareness to the Great War and to give us just a little glimpse of what these courageous soldiers endured for our way of life. I believe it's up to us as the commissioners to really spearhead the, the educational opportunities but also impart a little bit of that passion to, for people to look back in history and, and to understand where we came from and all of the sacrifices that have been made by our veterans across our the history of America to afford us the lifestyle that we have today. Uh, Tennessee State Parks is sponsoring an internal uh, living history group. This is made up of young park rangers that are all portraying soldiers from the Great War. We're focusing our efforts at the York site, but we'll also be uh, working with the Bicentennial Capitol Mall in Nashville, Tennessee to bring World War I living history to those particular sites. This year, our focus will be upon what's going on on the home front. Next year in 2008, and, and that will be in Jackson, Tennessee. In 2017, we're gonna look, focus on other Tennesseans who won the Medal of Honor. Everybody knows the story of Alvin C. York, but there were six other Medal of Honor winners, and we want to focus on those recipients as well as other people who did things of valor that have long been overdue. We want to look at African Americans. For example, Doug Fisher, has just written a book about African-American medical doctors in World War I. In 2018, we'll, we will come to the Alvin C. York site and Tennessee Tech, where we'll be doing reenactments and symposia. And then in 2019, we're gonna wrap everything up when we go back to the War Memorial in Nashville to rededicate the building, to put names on the wall whose names have been left out. For example, Kiffin Rockwell's name is not up there because he fought for the French. So we want to rededicate the, the, the memorial and hopefully have a concert there to wrap everything up. So this is a four-year enterprise, and we want to get lots and lots of Tennesseans involved. The results to be accomplished for all this effort are, one, a national outpouring of 
understanding uh, that the patriotism of the United States is not something to be uh, taken lightly and that the people who thought it important back in those days uh, became uh, so involved not only with their wealth and their, their lives but with the vision of the future for this nation. You cannot uh, uh, go forward unless you understand your history. That generation is gone. They're, they're not here to tell their stories. They're not here to tell us what they experienced. They're not here to tell us how the world has changed in the last 100 years. And so it's really up to us to take their stories and make sure that they're told for the next 100 years or longer. Um, but make sure that their stories and their sacrifices and their contributions to America are never forgotten. The next time you exercise one of the many freedoms we take for granted, remember all of the brave men and women who have put their lives on the line, some making the ultimate sacrifice, all to help ensure those freedoms remain and to make the world a better place to live. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.